And so there was something called Operation Valentine. And this took took place on Valentine's Day in 1982. And it was a big um, raid on um, the life sciences uh, laboratory. There would be a hundred people inside and a, and a bigger, I think, the bigger demonstration was outside. So the, there could have been 250 people involved. Is this a raid or is this a demo? And so whilst they were trying to negotiate their way in the front, all the activists were getting out the back, you know? And so there was, I think, nine beagles liberated and quite a few uh, rats and mice were liberated too. Quite a lot of damage, about 100,000 pounds worth of damage. There was transit vans totally smashed and everything, a lot of equipment uh, smashed up. This is my friend Roger, and this is my friends do the coolest. Shit. When did you get involved in animal rights, and when did that? What, what was kind of the thing that got you intrigued in it? I had a kind of full, false start to the uh, to the getting involved in 1977. Um, I joined the HSA Hunt Saboteurs, but there was nobody else around in my in my area, and so there was another bit of kind of um, two years of kind of doing not much. And then finally, everything fell into, into, into place in 1979. I'd moved down to Essex, got involved with a really good Essex group there. And then in the van, you'd do the usual thing, you'd get, get the leaflets from the different things. So I went vegan very quick. And so I never went through a, a vegetarian phase, which I'm eternally grateful for. You know, I'm really, really pleased that I didn't do that because I know a lot of people get stuck in all that, you know. So, yeah, so I was kind of like, you know, full on kind of ethical vegan, if you like or vegan, <laughs> um, since 79. And then because I'd come into it through the Hunt Saboteurs, I was turned on to the action side straight away in the sense that a lot of groups were asking for money, but the Hunt Saboteurs were asking for action. That really appealed to me, yeah? So could you do like a, the differences between the leagues and, and the ALF? Like what kind of set them apart? In, t in terms of what separated the league the leagues and the LF was their entire approach. I mean, the, the NAL had a good uh, slogan, which was kind of um, over the fence when they least expected it. And they kind of said that the LF was about creeping around in, in the dark, you know, in twos and threes, as, as it were. And so the league wanted to take hundreds of people into a place, uh, not least because it was good for the activists to actually see and smell and taste the inside of an animal use, uh, you know, kind of facility. And so that required that they did minimum amount of damage. Now, the ALF had a completely de different ethos. They thought, well, if you're going to go to the, all the trouble of getting in, the least you can do is smash the place up. Right? So it, it, was a, it, was a, it was a difference of, of, um, of emphasis. I mean, the, the NAL even had that attitude towards uh, hunt saboteurs. Rather than going as hunt saboteurs every week, you know, with with a couple of vans, you know, maybe 12, 13 people, you would maybe do it every two months and take a big crowd of people and actually shut them down. So they had this kind of mass thing going on with the ALF was this, the cell structure, which, you know, which might actually be about four people who really trusted each other. And there was a big kind of bond between them. And it, be, it became a very tight unit in, the, in that sense. The now thing was much more loose. And so there was something called Operation Valentine. And this took, took place on Valentine's Day in 1982. And it was a big um, raid on um, the life sciences uh, laboratory in a place called Stock, which is in Essex, one of the, one of the southern uh, counties in England. Well, from my point of view, it, it, it was like a BUAV event because what happened really was that the, the activists who were going to go inside were organized separately from the activists who were going to be outside. And only a few of us on the outside knew what was going on on the inside. And so a lot of people actually thought they were really going as a demonstration, whereas actually it was, it was almost like to slow the cops down when they arrived and to just generally get in the way 
and just create confusion, which, which, it, which it did. It, 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 did, it did that quite well. So as the police were arriving and then trying to say, what, what is this? Is this? Is this a raid or is this a demo? And then, you know, you, they have to go through that process of, you know, who's in charge and all that. It kind of slows them all down. And so whilst they were trying to negotiate their way in the front, all the activists were getting out the back. You know, and so there was, I think, nine beagles liberated and quite a few uh, rats and mice were liberated too. Quite a lot of damage, about 100,000 pounds of damage. That, this is the early 80s, so it's a lot of money now. Um, there was transit vans totally smashed and everything, a lot of equipment uh, smashed up. The interesting thing about Operation Valentine was that the, a the ALF had adopted the NAL structure for a while and did, and did a big daylight thing, which, which kind of didn't really work because you were in the daylight and you were still smashing stuff up. <laughs> Whereas, you know, I mean, if you're going to go in in the nighttime, smash things up and then you're gone, then you don't get caught. I mean, you know, if, you, if you're going to go in en masse and leaving loads of people, half of them thinking that they were in a demo, you know, it, it all kind of didn't quite fit, you know. It was kind of interesting the way that they tried to marry the two kind of methodologies, which didn't, didn't quite work. Operation Valentine is often like regarded as like one of the most historic ALF raids. But in retrospect, you're kind of saying that maybe it didn't really work as, as well as it could have. Why do you think it gets that tagline? Because of the size of it. You know, so I mean, there was 100 activists on the inside, yeah, and there must have been the same amount on the outside, if not more. And so the size of it, the fact that the BWV had, um, had some part of the organization of the outside bit, so that meant that their weight would be put to the, to the press coverage and they could do it in their own media as well. So I think it was just the fact that um, it was a big thing. And, and also, it was some of the first um, kind of mass arrests. And uh, I think about eight people eventually went to jail, you know. And so um, most of the people who were arrested, and there was more than 60, and I was, I was one of those, we were never charged because they were trying to sort us out. And, of course, everybody said that they were just part of the, of the outside demo. Yeah, and then they had to figure out whether they believed that or not, right? <laughs> so I suppose the ones that the ones that they believed, they then left you alone, and the ones that they didn't believe, they pursued the prosecution. It must have been a very complicated situation. I, I remember being in a in a gym with all the other people, and um, they were just trying to process us and find out, you know, who we were, where we lived. Like I say, everybody said we, we were just part of the demo, and a lot a lot of us at the time it was a, it was um, a habit at the time that when you got arrested, you used to say that your name was John Hughes. It was like a, just a name that everybody used. So you'd end up with like 40 people saying that they were John Hughes. So th that kind of thing was going on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the funny thing is a couple of years later, I was arrested in Liverpool for a, a demo outside something called Devil's Tower. It was a vivisection unit. And I just automatically used the name John Hughes when, when we got to the police station. <laughs> and then I was bailed in that name. And then the, the police arrived a few days later and charged me with fraud. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so this kind of habit of ours to use that name kind of backfired, well, it certainly backfired on me that, that, that particular day. I mean, like, it was a different thing there. But the idea was to hide your identity, not become famous like now. Right? You know, there was nobody trying to become a name in those days. Yeah. You kind of became a name despite yourself. The protest ends up liberating you know, a handful of, of animals. They do tens of thousands of pounds worth of damage. Um, eight out of a hundred people end up doing time for it. Um, and then life sciences kind of never recovers. I, I would say that in terms of the damage, there's different estimates. Um, one book puts it at 76,000 pounds and um, some reports put it at 100,000 pounds. And then in, ter in terms of the, the amount of activists, there would be a hundred people inside and a, and a bigger, I think the bigger demonstration was outside. So the, they could have been 250 people involved with that. Yeah. So it's, it was a really interesting mix. I mean, from, from, um, from a tactical point of view, it's a really interesting mix of the kind of now type stuff or the league type stuff and the ALF type stuff. And it w it was then there was this kind of, uh, you know, should we have done that? Should we have done a mass daylight thing? Unless it was a now mass daylight thing, 
the ALF mass daylight thing became problematic because of the damage. Like Operation Valentine it kind of ended up becoming like the last time the ALF really did or attempted anything like that. Then it kind of moved back into its covert. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. And so that was a deliberate thing that the idea was to go back to the to the cell structure, which was obviously much more secure and much more independent. In fact, um, some authors argue that um, the NAL didn't like the autonomy that the ALF cells had because their structure was much more hierarchical. They wanted to have kind of, you know, prime movers and leaders and all that kind of stuff, which ironically, the police thought that the ALF was like that, but the ALF was much looser than that. So, you know, I mean, it's interesting, you know, when you see the histories of things, you know, the way that things are rewritten, you know, it's, it, you know, it's, but some of it is Alice in Wonderland stuff. I mean, some people said that, you know, the ALF was like um, a commando unit, you know, this military preci precision and all this kind of stuff. That's, that's bullshit, you know. I mean, that, that, just, that just happened. I mean, it was, it was a lot of very kind of committed and willing people doing the best they could in the given circumstances. But the idea that it was a kind of military operation was just nonsense. You know, I mean, the NAL was more like that than the ALF. Do you think that hierarchical structure ended up um, in dismantling now? Because then the cops knew who to go after and how to dismantle it? Yeah, it could be. I mean, there was a few, a couple of um, high profile uh, cases. I was involved with one it's called Battery 22. And that's when 22 of us was, was um, arrested at a battery cage. It was one of these deep pit things where you, you go on the lower floor and it was all the manure and everything. And you'd look up and there's, you know, thousands of feet, you know, um, look, looking at. And so um, we got arrested there. But that, that's the story for another day. But um, And then there was a big problem, which was the ICI raid that they now did. And that's when they, the police really clamped down. There's, a, there's always a, like a tipping point, you know? You probably wouldn't expect the police to particularly understand the difference between the ALF and the NAL anyway. And so I suppose from their point of view, they just regarded it all as much of a muchness. And so they, they came down heavy on the NAL probably because the ALF had gone back to the cell structure and they were doing a lot. I mean, one, one author, in a book called Animal Warfare, said that in England at the time, there was six ALF actions per night going on. You would kind of dream about that kind of stuff now. I mean, you wouldn't get six a year now. As a press officer, obviously, you saw the effects of what you know, underground direct action had on, particularly in the early 80s, on the vivisection industry and the fur industry. Do you think there's still a valuable place for you know, underground direct action in an animal rights movement? It's, di it's difficult to say now because, uh, as you know, as the cranky vegan, you know, the focus of the movement has, has changed a lot. And I, I know you're interested in, in bringing back the pressure element to it. Um, exactly, exactly how that fits now with all the new surveillance is an issue. And it would, it would generally be an issue in the sense that I always say that the kind of stuff that went on in my day, in the 80s and your day in the 90s, we would have to have a severely modified version of, of that. As I always say, like, I think we should do and support tactics and strategies that, that work and make sense, regardless of what they are. So, I, you know, like, like you said, like in your time in the 80s and then into the 90s and then through the Shack campaign, you saw direct action work in really important and big ways. Um, but it definitely has fallen off the map. And I'm wondering if that's because that's just the culture that we're in or because of security or because people just aren't familiar with it anymore or don't regard it as a good tactic. I don't know. I, I certainly don't have that answer, but um, I think it's an interesting conversation for sure. Cause you, you look at the eighties in England and you see how much just, you know, underground direct action alone decimated the, the vivisection industry. It's, you know, the activist culture has changed. You know, I always kind of make a, make a point that, you know, you could be regarded now as an extremist, and a militant if you hold a laptop in the street now. You know, there's a lot kind of change now. And, and in fact, um, a lot of people seem to criticize that kind of action if they see it uh, taken nowadays, we, yeah. which, which is um, something that would never have happened back then. But at the same time, I suppose the direct action then was seen as the kind of um, the leading part of it, the point of the movement and everything else would flow through uh, after the after that kind of punched the hole in the, the enemy or whatever. Um, 
I don't I don't think people think of it in, in those terms anymore. And another phrase I often use is that um, rather than looking for enemies to fight, people are looking for people to educate now. And so I think that's part of it. I think it's a complicated sociological and psychological issue now because um, we've got different kind of people. We, we've got people who are not as radical now. It's one of, one of the issues about the movement. I mean, it, I'm used to the idea that in a social movement, the young people in the movement are more radical than the older people in the movement, who's kind of moderated by then. But it's not, it's not happened in the vegan animal rights movement. The old people are still more radical than the new people coming in, who seem to have adopted moderation, reducitarian. It's almost kind of bizarre, you kind of, kind of going, because I, I, I thought, you know, if you said to the youngsters, do you know what, there's a real radical history to this movement, they'd be go, oh, really? Uh, and they're not interested. Yeah. Well, you, I mean, you know that yourself, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, that's how I got started was digging through boxes of, of magazines in the corner of a record store in 1995 and finding undergrounds, you know, the underground magazine and press office Zines, stuff. Yeah. And, yeah. And Sea Shepherd logs and reading about animal liberation front and direct action. And be like, oh, this radical history is amazing. And I just wanted to devour as much of it as I possibly could. What was happening in that culture in that time that that was appealing to people as opposed to now when that's just not something that's even thought about? Well, we're just talking about different times, Jake, you know, in the sense that um, it was closer to the, you know, the Vietnam War kind of demos, civil rights in North America, the birth of second wave feminism. So there was a radical edge to society that seems to have gone. I mean, I mean, I, I've done academia, as you know, and, you know, academics. I've lost count of the number of academics who kind of bemoan the fact that their students are not radical anymore. They're not political anymore. The only thing they'll go and demo about is their own fees. In terms of something political and certainly something radical political, they're kind of not interested anymore. And, and universities have changed. Universities are all about creating critical thinkers. Now universities are all about making people who can fit into capitalism. It's completely different. And I think it's different. You know, I mean, we've got a neoliberal culture now. And we just are not breeding radicals like we did. You don't see that same spark to it anymore. Like I say, it's, it's been noticed in academia as well as social movements. So it's a, it's a widespread cultural change and a moderation of things. Well, thanks for that depressing end. I appreciate that. I, yeah, uh, I, was, you... I was working on it. I was working on it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, what, what would you suggest that people kind of dig into now to, to read and, and discover more about that time period from the late 70s to the early 90s? Uh, well, the best resource they, they can do, just one single website, and it's called the Talon Conspiracy. And there you've got all the zines, all the liberators for the VUAV, an interesting magazine called The Beast is all there. Uh, you got you got this book online that's um, against all odds from, I think this is about 82, isn't it? 86. So there's a lot of scanned resources all on that one website. And it goes all the way through the years and all the organizations, all the individuals. You, you, you're, you're in it for a start. And so... <laughs> As are you. <laughs> you click on an image and the magazine from the 1970s pops up and you can read it, you know, like, you know, like a Kindle kind of thing. All right. Well, thanks so much, Roger. Do you have anything else depressing you want to add to the end of this particular? Uh, so I think I think, I think I've, I've run out of depressing stuff now.